together in the Apostles' Creed. Let us begin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Because Thanksgiving is that way. It should be a time of joy, of expectation. It should be a time when we're all sitting back and beginning to plan our menus. It's a time when we sit back and think, family's coming, how do we get everything together and ready? But we know that this year is different. That same joy and want is still there. But we know that if I was to go through and ask you for what you're thankful for, we would give some gut responses. We could say, hey, I'm so thankful that I have family. I'm so thankful that I can go get a turkey to put in the oven. I'm so thankful that I can come today and worship with each of you, even though we have to be distant and even though we're in a time of fear. But within that, we realize that we come today, and if we were to be honest, on the outward portion of ourselves, we would almost say, what do we have to be thankful for? We're separated from one another. There's chaos. There are worries across the land. We sit back and worry, am I going to get the virus? Who was I with this last time? And we start looking that way, and it's so easy to give up the joy of this season, but also to be able to look away from what we are thankful for. 
So I went looking last night and I dug up the top five worries of what's going on in the world today. And if you ever wondered what everyone else is worrying about, this is where it begins, is that in those top five, the number one is the coronavirus. It's the number one worry we have. The second one is unemployment. The third is poverty. The fourth is financial and political corruption. And the fifth is crime and violence. And when you sit back today and you start thinking about this, it's kind of hard at times to be able to be thankful when you feel like the world around you is collapsing, when everything is going wrong within your life. But it draws me away on this Sunday before Thanksgiving to look at something which is even deeper. And that's the story of the ten lepers in the Gospel of Luke. When you think about leprosy for a moment, the real question is what today are the things that kind of rot your soul? Because that's what leprosy was. It was a rotting of the skin. It was a slowly dying from without going within. And so when we hear this story from the 17th chapter of Luke, it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priest. And they went, and they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was the Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has not one returned to give thanks to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. If you think about this story for one moment, we become those ten lepers. And what has to happen within our world is that when we take the idea of leprosy and our worries, and we look at them interchangeably, we find they are much the same. That these are the things that draw us away, and these are the things that we should look at. We should be able to look at ourselves and how often we ourselves come to God and we look at the world and we say, Oh Lord, when's something going to happen? Oh Lord, when are you going to come back again and end all this stuff? And that's what these ten were doing. They went by and they had saw Jesus coming and they started shouting out, Master, have pity on us. I think that's in some ways where the church is today. We're looking to God and we're crying out, Master, have pity on us. And we're looking at the superficial things which are going on around us instead of looking at the heart of the matter. Of being able to say, Lord, forgive me, the sinner, even though I may be the greatest sinner of all. Heal me from within that I can find the joy once more. When we look at our faith, to be able to look and say, God, give me the passion once again in my life to truly reach out and in my everyday life that I live before others and the words that I say and the prayers that I live to do it in such an earnest way that it bears relationship with you. You see, when we ourselves suffer, we do stand at that distance and we call out to God. And how many times has God answered us in the church? How many prayers has he answered and given to us? How many new friends? How many acquaintances? How many times has he truly Healed. And I know that in this world today, some people are looking at that healing, and we forget that healing goes not only in our idea of desire, but healing also goes into God's idea of desire, which is total healing. That of being able to call a child home so there's no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow. These nine sat there, and Jesus sat with them and said, this is what you need to do. And this is 
part of why this story becomes important. I think 1 Thessalonians says it best in the fifth chapter. He looks and he says, if you really want to be healed, he says, go show yourself to the priest. I think here Paul is telling the people of Thessalonica, if you really want to be healed, this is what you got to do. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Pray this in God's will for you in Christ Jesus. To be able to think if we want that healing, we ourselves have to do something. It's not just sit still and wait. But it's to take time to rejoice in the things that we want and desire. I can sit back and look at this Thanksgiving week and go, you know, what will we even do? Sarah's doctor has turned back around and has looked and says, I really don't want you around family gatherings because you're so close to your due date. I understand that. God forbid that I be the one that brings harm to my grandchildren or my own children. But at the same time, I still have that desire to go and brine that turkey, to put it in the oven. I still have that desire to make Grandma Medley's chocolate pies. I still have that desire to have that great cranberry sauce and to be able to have that turkey and dressing and to do all these things. And I can look at it from that sense of saying, what's the use? Or I can look at it and ask, what's stopping me? What's stopping me from continuing to do the things that bring me joy but myself? Are we not all within that? When you look at your life and you look at your worry, what really brings that worry upon you? Another study I looked at was a study that's done on people that had anxiety disorder, had worry disorder. And as they studied them and talked to them about their worries, they found that 87% of the worries that they had never happened. 87%. You've got a better chance in joy than you do in worry. You have a better chance in hope than you do in worry. It doesn't mean that worry and anxiety doesn't exist. Yes, it exists. But what we do with that worry is what's important. These ten were socially distant from the entire community. These ten saw their health going down. These ten wondered if the other nine would even be there tomorrow. And Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest and you will be healed. And they did so. But the secret within this is for us to remember that once we do that and we find the healing, what we do with that. During this time of crisis, one of the favorite scriptures being used today is 2 Chronicles. And it probably be familiar, it's in the 7th chapter, 14th verse, and it says, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. What do we need to be able to do? We need to be able to humble ourselves to go before God. We need to humble ourselves to a point that once we go before God and we lay out our petition before him, a petition that say may be protect us all from this virus or in this virus that looks at us and say, God, bless those who are without and those that worry about their tomorrow. Bless these who are worried about the connection with their families. And once we see that blessing there, we humble ourselves to truly go to God and give God thanks. And I think that the story from Luke kind of tells us what that looks like. This leper did not come back just to one, and he didn't stand and say, hey, by the way, thank you. What he did is he threw himself at Jesus' feet. He humbled himself before him. He looked up at him, and he gave praise and thanksgiving. And then the question was asked, weren't there ten? Where are the other nine? How often do 
does God hear our prayers? And then we turn back around and we sit back and go, how often do we spend time thanking Him, humbling ourselves before Him, saying, God, none of this would be possible without You. You are the means and You are the one. It's when we humble ourselves that we begin to realize what Thessalonians was saying and rejoice always. It means that we've taken time to see that we have a reason to rejoice. And it's through that prayer and prayer continually that we ourselves lift ourselves before God and humble ourselves saying, God, I can't do this by myself. It wasn't the lepers that went and stood before the priests that healed themselves. It was in the faith in Jesus Christ, in that faith and hope in Jesus Christ, to stand before him and say, this is my need. It's time for us to stand before God in that humble way and say, God, this is my need. And therefore, he can heal our land. But when he starts giving us that healing, that we look to God and we give God thanks for that healing, that we remember where it came from. Jesus looks to the one and says, where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? And he says, there's no one turned to give thanks except for this one outcast, the Samaritan, the foreigner. And notice the words he said to him were, you are privileged among the others. He looked and he says, go, your faith has healed you. You see, thanksgiving is also about faith. It's about thankfulness. It's about us looking over and being able to remember those words from Thessalonians that says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Should on this Thanksgiving Sunday, as we look towards Thursday, and we look at all the good that can happen, should this not be where we enter into this week? In a time of rejoicing, a time of praying, a time of giving thanks. I can go back and I can make that turkey, and you know what? I can slice up and that the place, and I can take the people who may not have. That's a way of saying thank you. I can always rejoice by sending out letters that may say to the people that I love, I'm thinking of you and I miss you on this day. That's giving thanks. And it's being able to look at God in our earnest heart this day and say, God, as we enter this time of thanksgiving that leads us in time of Advent and preparation for the celebration of Christmas, I give you thanks. And I pray for this world continually. And I rejoice when I see the lights, when I hear the children's songs, when I have hope because Christmas is coming and it's going to come and Thanksgiving's going to come and we're all going to gain a couple of pounds. And that's something to be thankful of in this day. So come ye thankful people come? Yes. Come because this is still the blessed harvest home when we look to God first within our lives. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks because we have been blessed abundantly. You have blessed us in ways that we have comfort, we have hope, we have tomorrow. And we give you thanks that this day we have our health and we pray that we'll continue to have our health through all our tomorrows. But on this day as we look towards Thanksgiving, we pray, O oh Lord, that you put a joy in our hearts, that you put thanksgiving upon our lips, that we will not see this as a time of struggle, but we'll see it as a time of truly rejoicing in you as we lift your name before the world. And we remember the words from Henry Nowell that says, when we lift them, people will look to us and say, see how much they love their God. And from the blessings, they'll say, see how much God loves his people. Let's stand as we join together in our closing hymn number 131. We gather together.
you the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his counsel upon you and give you peace for your journey. Amen. Go in peace.